Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening to you all. My name is Dusa McDuff, and I'd like to welcome you to this special lecture in the Women in Mathematics program, but which it's open to everybody. Uh, I'm going to start with just a few words about our program and then introduce the speakers. So I'm one of the organizers of this year's Women in Mathematics program, which is an intense 11-day mentoring program in which women pursuing degrees in mathematics at all levels, some of them are undergraduates, some of them are graduate students and postdocs, are able to interact and learn from research mathematicians. The program is supported by the National Science Foundation, has been hosted by the Institute and Princeton University since 1994. It's designed to address issues of gender imbalance in mathematics. Activities include lectures and seminars on mathematical topics of current interest, women in sciences seminars of issues of concern to women mathematicians, as well as mentoring and networking opportunities. Today's talk is the second now annual opportunity we've had to bring in top level external leaders to share and mentor based on their experience using mathematics data and analytical techniques in the business world. So we're delighted to have Sandy Peterson and Kathy Wengel, both of Johnson & Johnson, to give us a glimpse into the important role and opportunities for applying mathematics to the life cycle of a product. Sandy and Kathy both have deep New Jersey roots and are alumni of Princeton University. So let me say a little bit first about Sandy. She's Executive Vice President, Group Worldwide Chairman for Johnson & Johnson, which is the world's largest healthcare company. Before joining Johnson & Johnson, she was chairman and CEO of Bayer, Crop Science AG in Germany. She's had many other important leadership positions in other, in, in other companies. She holds a BA from Cornell University and a master's in public administration from Princeton. She's a member of the board of directors of Microsoft and other advisory boards, as well as on the Institute Board of Trustees. She's also a dedicated mentor to and model for other women um, she's been named to Fortune Magazine's list of the most powerful women three times, most re recently in 2015. Our other speaker is Kathy Wengel. She's currently worldwide vice president of Johnson & Johnson Supply Chain and serves in leadership roles in various committees within the Johnson & Johnson structure. She's been there for 28 years and has served in a variety of strategic leadership and executive roles with increase, increasing responsibility, where she interfaced with almost every business segment across the whole enterprise. She, her experience there it includes seven years in Puerto Rico and eight years in Europe. Kathy has a, BS, a BSE degree in civil engineering and operations research from Princeton University. She's a leading mentor for other women in business and executive sponsor for Johnson & Johnson's Women Leadership Initiative. She's had also had many recognitions. She was recognized by the National Association of Female Executives through their Women of Excellence Award in 2015 and received the 2015 Thinkers and Movers Award for Innovative Leadership by the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sandy and Kathy. It's great to be back here. I was actually in this auditorium um, on Friday night. And Friday night, for those of you who are here, was a very special evening because we got to celebrate Emmy Noether. Those of you who are mathematicians, I clearly don't have to tell you anything about her and how remarkable she was, not only as a woman, but as a mathematician, and her resilience of doing what she did in Germany and then coming to the United States. But you know, for me personally, while I was sitting here listening to all the conversation about her life, the impact she's had on math and physics, um, and what she did, the thing that also struck me, of, and you all know this, she was 53 years old when she died. She died from complications from a surgery, which is really very tragic. Now, Johnson & Johnson is a company that will celebrate its 130th anniversary next year. And for those of you who don't know much about us, you probably know us as baby products and Band-Aids and things like that. But Johnson & Johnson was actually started um, not very far from here during the Civil War to prevent infections that, it caused, that, it caught, that happened due to surgeries. And so I was sitting here Friday night ironically thinking, 
Well, isn't that interesting? We're talking about math, this unbelievable woman in math who won honors and it took another 60 years before another woman actually achieved that kind of honor and she died from complications of surgery. And one of the things J&J &J has been doing since its founding is been working to improve surgeries, techniques of surgery, and to prevent surgeries from happening. So I just thought it was very fitting to share that story with you. Um, and what we wanted to do today um, was talk a little bit about the role of math in what we do day in and day out. Um, we were joking on the way over here that I know some of you were in a lecture. I can't even describe and even say the title of that lecture because it sounded like a very complicated, very high order math lecture. But we thought it'd be helpful to give you some perspective on um, what we do, the role of math and what we do. And we wanted to do it in part by telling you some stories about our own personal lives, our careers, and how we ended up where we are today, standing in front of all of you. So um, as I said, J&J &J is a very broad-based company. We operate from biologics through many different devices, all the way to many consumer products, including lotions and other sorts of things, and we operate all over the world. And we say that we touch at least one billion lives a day and hopefully improve them. So the breadth and depth of what we do is really quite remarkable. Um, and this gives you a sense of some of what Kathy and I do every day. So um, on the, that's a picture of me, and um, I'm in a slum in Mumbai. And I'm in a slum in Mumbai because we found a way through the wonders of mobile technology to actually have interactions with very, very poor women who don't even have any running water, and we enable them to learn what they need to do to take care of themselves during pregnancy so that they actually have a healthy birth, which is really quite remarkable. Kathy, on the other hand, is in Korea with our colleagues in Korea working on a biologics vaccine plant that we work on. So we get to do very cool things every day in our careers. And it's, uh, it's really quite a lot of fun and remarkable. So let me just give you a little bit of um, a background about myself. So um, I actually grew up part of my childhood in rural Vermont. And I lived um, in a little teeny town in rural Vermont that had about 300 people who lived in that town. Um, and I actually, even though my kids tease me and say that's really not possible, you're exaggerating, Mom. I used to walk a mile every day to the school bus. <laughs> and it's really true. Um, downhill one way, not both ways. Um, <laughs> uphill, yes. And, um, and then I would get on a school bus, and it would take me 45 minutes to an hour trudging through the fields to get to uh, the school I went to. But while I was also um, living in this town, um, this town, the one thing it had going for it is it had a small ski resort, a little picture of a nice little ski resort in rural Vermont. When I was 13 years old, um, I started working at that ski resort. That was back in the day when I don't think people cared much about labor laws and it was a mm -hmm. pretty rural place. My first job in that ski resort was over the Christmas holidays and I had the wonderful job of being a chambermaid. I did that for two weeks during Christmas vacation. Now, one of the things that that taught me is I'm going to make sure that whatever I do in life, it actually propels me out of being a chambermaid for the rest of my life. <laughs> but one of the things during this time in my life is I actually got to do everything possible as jobs in this ski resort. It was a small family-run ski resort, and I literally did everything. I took tickets, I checked <laughs> the bills, I worked in the, I worked throughout that whole ski resort. And I think without really realizing it, by the end of that period of time, I probably got some sense of business and some appreciation for business, although I wasn't planning on going into business. Um, I then went to, um, uh, grad to undergraduate school. I went to Cornell. I did not go to your alma mater, although I did show up here later. Um, and when I was at Cornell, I ended up studying um, science policy, government, and economics. And I had a great time, it was a wonderful experience, um, and I had a very good education. I then left college, took a couple of jobs doing some things in New York, and then I was very fortunate to um, be given a full scholarship to the Woodrow Wilson School uh, at Princeton. 
And I chose to go to the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton for a couple reasons. One is when you're given a full scholarship, it's kind of hard to turn that down. It was really an honor. But it also allowed me to go to graduate school, as I like to say to this day, without having to make a decision. I could go get a master's degree at Princeton and in applied economics, and I could delay the decision, do I want to be an academic, because I could still go get a PhD. Do I want to go work in the government, or do I want to go work uh, in industry? Now, you're probably all sitting here saying, what does this have to do with math and women in math? Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with math and women in math. I chose, when I went to the Woodrow Wilson School, that I was going to do the hardcore math track in economics at Princeton. Now, many of the people who were in that program, the joke was, well, they ended up becoming economists because they weren't good enough to be physicists or mathematicians, but they obviously were pretty good at math. Well, guess what? When I was an undergraduate in, in, in college, I did not take one math class. I, the last math class I took was in high school, and it was pre-calculus and trigonometry. And for those of you in the room, that's not math, right? That's adding, subtracting kinds of things. So you see this little book here? I still have this book. Now, I probably was completely crazy to do this, but I went and I took the hardest econ economics classes in the graduate school program without actually knowing calculus, integral calculus, linear algebra, or any of those wonderful things. This was my Bible. I went to a three-week boot camp for people who were supposed to touch up on their math skills, not actually learn the basics of math, <laughs> Um, and that was the point of this three-week class. So I did this three-week boot camp program, and then this thing sat next to me every single day for my two years as, an under, as a graduate student at Princeton. Um, I obviously still own this thing because it's very much attached to me in some way, shape, or form. Um, I don't actually think I can do any of these equations anymore, but they're kind of, for you guys, this would be a joke. But even for me at that point in time, it was a very big deal. So I taught myself math to get a degree in applied economics from Princeton. Um, uh, and obviously, I, some of these principles I don't really know, but I, I learned a lot. And it's helped me through the rest of my career, having done that. I then left Princeton. And at that point in time, I made the decision to um, go into business. Um, and I was fortunate that I, um, I ended up getting a, a job at McKinsey, one of those consulting firms. But what was interesting about it is I was in the second group of people that they had decided they would hire that didn't have MBAs. So they believed in the early days, they've learned better since then, they believed that you had to have an MBA to work in business and be a business consultant. And they did an experiment. And the experiment was let's bring in 12 people who had graduate degrees from other disciplines, um, who don't have an MBA, and we can see whether we can teach them business and see whether they will be successful or not. So I was one of those 12 people. Um, four of us were women at the time. And um, I stayed at McKinsey for six years. I did all sorts of very interesting, crazy things. I worked on jet engines. I worked on studies with mainframe computers. I worked in the telecom business. I worked on car, the car industry. I worked in packaged goods. So I worked on all sorts of very cool, interesting things. And I think one of the things, with being a consultant, that was very similar to being in, um, in school was your goal in life was to know all the answers, to be really smart, to do your homework, and to be the smartest person in the room, even if, in my case, you were a woman and you were probably the youngest person in the room. So that really helped me. What I did as an undergraduate and graduate student, I continued that for six years. And then I went off and worked in industry. Um, and one of the stories I wanted to tell you about was when I was probably in my early 30s, I learned that being the smartest person and having all the answers and studying all the time is actually not necessarily how you succeed in life when you're outside of those kinds of settings. So I was very fortunate. At uh, one point early in my career, about 20 years ago, um, I ended up working at Nabisco, um, a great New Jersey company that unfortunately is kind of no more, but they still have a facility in East Hanover, New Jersey. 
and I was hired to be responsible for uh, R&D, quality, and regulatory affairs. By the way, again, I did not have a degree in any of those things, and somebody thought that I knew enough about policy and could work with people that I could do that. Um, and one of the things that's in their portfolio is the Oreo cookie. So how many of you, I hope you guys like Oreos. Okay, so I have a little quiz for you. How many of you in this room are dunkers? Who dunks their Oreos? Oh, you guys are so shy. You can admit it, it's okay. Who are twisters? Ooh, we have more twisters. Who are the wads? Okay, who eats the cream first? Ha. Ah. Okay, good. That's great. So one of the things that's really cool about this product is that it's basically been the same for a very long period of time. The one thing that changed about 40 years ago is they took lard out of the cream. Believe it or not, the cream used to be made with lard, um, which actually makes it taste unbelievably good if you've ever had one. <laughs> it's worth it. That's all I can say. But anyway, one of the things that um, was happening at Nabisco was I was, um, I went and did this little analysis and study um, because I was responsible for being the steward of the, the recipe, so to speak, and making sure that we were living up to the quality standards that we'd always had as a company. And I found out that, and this is not surprising, I'm sure to any of you, I found out that over time, um, our colleagues in supply chain um, were given cost reduction targets not like every year. And what would they would do is they would go in and, you know, take a few bits of the cocoa out or take a little bit of the cream out. And the way in which this works is you give last year's product to a consumer, you do these consumer testing panels, and then you give the new version to the same people and you ask them, do they taste the same or not? And you don't tell them which is which. Well, they do taste the same because the difference isn't very much. It's a very little bit of a difference. It's just shaving a little bit of the cream out. But the problem was is that when you went back to the original recipe from 10 years ago and then you looked at it, you know, it's the old salami tactics problem, and you look at the recipe from today and you ask the consumer, are these the same? First of all, visually you could tell they weren't the same, but then obviously they didn't taste the same. So here's me, I'm smart. I did all the statistical analysis, we went through all the data, we demonstrated that you know this was a real problem, it was gonna degrade the brand, and isn't that terrible, we're gonna lose our consumers, et cetera, et cetera. So I went marching into an executive committee meeting, and we used to have them on Monday morning, and we were supposed to do updates, and I just got up there and I was so proud of myself, I explained to everybody, this is what happened and isn't this awful and we have to fix it. Well, what do you guys think happened? The supply chain guy, and by the way, he wasn't a wonderful young woman like Kathy here, he was a crusty old manufacturing guy, sat there and said, I, she just threw me under the bus. Every year I'm getting all this pressure and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and she just stood up in front of everybody and threw me under the bus. So it's a lesson I learned 20 years ago. It sounds like a small, silly thing, but it is one of those important lessons in life. You, um, and I learned the hard way from that experience because this guy from then on in was never gonna help me with anything that I needed help on. Um, that instead of throwing this poor guy under the bus, I should have walked into his office and said, hey, did you know, I, you probably know this and it's really not fair. Why do you keep getting these cost reduction targets and it's not good for the products? Let's go together and explain this and figure out how to do it in a different way. It's a great lesson I learned uh, at a certain point in my career, which I think to this day um, has helped me in lots of different things that I'm doing um, even today. So um, from there, obviously, I went on and did a, a number of other things. What I wanted to now talk about is what does all of this have to do with math, right? So there's statistical analysis done here. Yes, it's probably simple math compared to much of what you all work on. But one of the things that's really remarkable that I've seen happen in my professional career, and it's part of everything we do in every part of J&J &J today, is math matters, and it's embedded in all of the things that we do. Now, if you think about what marketing was like 20, 30 years ago, right? We have our friend here, Mr. Draper, three martini lunches, coming up back after lunch, sitting around a room, throwing out ideas, coming up with cute little marketing jingles, 
selling some stuff. That was what marketing and communications was like in the old day. Today, we actually, marketing today is all about an analysis, numbers, and mathematics. It's remarkable how it has changed. If you look at what happens with um, the people who now occupy marketing departments in our company and other companies, they have to be very analytically rigorous. They have to have good analytical skills, and they need to know how to use them. They need to have, have create models and figure out a lot of complexity about how do you optimize something with many, many different variables in very different markets. Now, obviously, they have to have a little bit of flair for marketing, but they also have to be very analytically deep, and they have to be very comfortable with numbers and analysis. And it's a sea change that's happened in the last 20 to 25 years in marketing. And it's not just our company, it's all companies that have gone through that change. The other thing that has happened is we use math and mathematics and scientific uh, principles in many other things that we do as a company. This is an example of one of our products, Neutrogena, which is a sunscreen. Now, for those of you who know anything about melanoma and skin cancer, one in five Americans are diagnosed with skin cancer at some time in their life. While we're sitting or standing in here and being in this room today, one person is going to die from melanoma. One person dies every 52 minutes from melanoma in the United States. A huge problem, a huge challenge. So what does that have to do with math again? So I'll give you a couple of examples. One of the things that we now do is we actually do very targeted marketing and very targeted communication. Um, depending upon where the sun is shining, what you know, the UV um, rays look like, and we actually do, do a lot of work of communicating that to schools, to individuals, through all sorts of social media, and all sorts of other things. It's, uh, you know, it's a hopefully a much more effective way than, you know, your mom telling you as, your, as, a, as a kid put on your sunscreen, but it's something that we do. One of the other interesting things that we do, which is really um, fascinating, is zinc is a very effective uh, material to help prevent um, skin damage from the rays of the sun. Now, it's not because it's a barrier, it's because of the bandage uh, uh, in zinc. And one of the things that our scientists have done is they've actually worked, they've used a lot of the principles that get used in the semiconductor industry to change that, to change that band and change that wave pattern, and to enable people, us to actually do some very breakthrough things in get, bringing products to the marketplace that are fundamentally different than anything anybody else has in the marketplace to improve um, the protection of the skin and to prevent skin cancer. So those are just a couple of examples of how we use math in R&D and in marketing in many other things that we do. But look at this portfolio of products. We have an amazing array of things that we do, and from R&D through manufacturing, which Kathy will talk mm -hmm. more about, all the way through marketing distribution, we actually have a lot of people that do a lot of work where you need to have very deep analytical skills to be able to do this work. Um, somebody told me a statistic the other day. We have 460 terabytes of data that we process every single day, whether it's in R&D and other places. Um, that probably, to many of you, doesn't seem like a lot of data, but I love to, you know, the, the analogy that it's three times the amount of data that sits in the IRS's data warehouse. So if you had told us that five years ago, we would have said, no way. We, this is not, we're not a data analysis company. We don't do these sorts of things. It's part of who we are and what we do, and it's only going to become more so. And so people who really are comfortable with math, with analytics, with problem-solving skills mm -hmm. become much more important to us over time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy in a moment. But why that is so important and why Kathy and I were very happy to come and talk to you today is one of the things that's a big part of who we are as Johnson & Johnson is we believe we need to support communities. We need to further education. And she and I have a very particular personal passion about furthering the careers of women um, in, in the STEM fields, whether it's from kindergarten through universities 
all the way to support people in their professions. And we're making it a very big part of what we do and really encouraging more and more women to be comfortable as little girls to be in these fields, but ensuring that they stay in them and they don't drop out. Because unfortunately, we all know that people frequently drop out and they don't need to drop out. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the things that I learned through my career is um, you never know where you're going to end up from a, the middle of nowhere in Vermont. I've learned a lot of different things. And when I was an undergraduate and a graduate student, I never expected to be where I am today. But by using good analytical skills, problem solving mm -hmm. skills, and being open to learning and doing new and different things, you know, you can do lots of fun and interesting things. We impact a billion people's lives every single day. We make them better. That's a pretty cool thing to do. So with that, I will turn it over to Kathy, who will talk a little bit about her experiences. And I would just say that it's a great pleasure to work with Kathy, as you've heard. I've only been at J&J &J for four years. Kathy's been there for over 25 years. And she's a great colleague. And she's a great role model for women who took the math and sciences seriously, even as a kid, unlike myself, and has stuck with it for her whole career. Well, thank you, Sandy, and it is great to be here with everyone. Um, really like to start on the slide and give you a little insight into it. So the acronym at the top starts for women in STEM, which we all know, science, technology, engineering, and math. And the two is to make the M squared. You can see we don't even get that right, right on our slide as an exponent. But for math and manufacturing. And the D is for design. And so because when we look at all of these fields and we look at what's happening in our worlds today in technology, it's all about how we design products to create innovation for consumers. Then we have to be able to put the science behind them, the technology and how we manufacture them and be able, as Sandy said, to get the analytics right, to get them to the consumers and patients who need them most. So our spin on, sp on STEM is to really expand that to that design thinking about how we bring all those to life. And the way we've organized this program is with partnerships in the external world, with university partnerships, with K through 12. But what's special about this is the organization of these three buckets came from some really deep insights from women like you, from women who work in these fields, about what made them come into the fields and what made them want to stay, and all those beautiful twists and turns that we each take in a really different way throughout our career. So with Sandy, we heard about, imagine someone having this level of impact, one of the most incredible leaders I've ever had the privilege to work for and with, who never took a math class, and yet leads one of the largest analytics organizations in our industry, technology organizations. So imagine what you can do, or imagine what she could have done if she'd actually taken a math class <laughs> in school. <laughs> but so I wanted to tell you and start by telling you a little bit about my story, because it tends to follow this flow. And then after that, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers and to talk with all of you, which is really why we're, why we're here. So I'm going to start my story really pre-K. So this picture up there is 100 years old. And in the very back, in the last row of that horse and buggy, is my grandmother when she was a very little girl. And this was taken at my great-grandparents' farm in Falls City, Nebraska. My great-grandparents were farmers. Uh, they had a large farm, and my great-grandfather's brother had another farm. And my great-grandfather only went to school through about third grade but he taught himself math. He went on to become the chairman of the finance committee in the unicameral legislature in Nebraska for a few years. And he believed in the value of an education. So while he was a farmer and contributed his community and built a business for the family, he happened to have the fortune, or at that time maybe thought of the misfortune, to have three daughters. Now, in that day, when you had kids on a farm, you were creating your own labor force. So three girls. OK, well, how do you work with that? Well, one of the things that I believe helped make me into the, the life and the I've had was that my great-grandparents chose, in the middle of the Great Depression, to send all three of their daughters to the University of Nebraska. My great-grandmas were the 
laughing stock of the farming community. This was not understood, but my family understood what that could mean for their futures. Now, my, great -gran my grandmother was the youngest of three, and so her two older sisters went first, and they both became teachers and had good careers and enjoyed that very much and went into that, that the profession. My grandmother, though, had spent a lot of time with her male cousins and was beginning to be interested in the biology and the science of farming, and so she decided to actually go into the sciences. And in my hand, very special to me, is the Introduction to Organic Chemistry, copyrighted in 1928 with my grandmother's name. And so she, in that depression, went in and got herself a science degree. She became a chemist in laboratories and hospitals, and so she created her path until she became a full-time mom. So generations from that came to me. She's my father's mother. And so now let's jump to my story. So up on the screen, my mother, by the way, had a tremendous amount of fun picking out what pictures that I would show you. <laughs> I did have final approval, though, and there are many of those that I said, no, I'm not ready to share with an audience of people I don't know. But that is me at the age of two. And according to my parents, that is the moment where they knew that I was going to be an engineer or something like that. So despite dolls from, and other gifts, the story goes that I would just cast them aside, and I would say, give me the blocks. Give me the Lincoln Logs. Give me the things to build. So that was one of my first successful engineering projects. <laughs> and, it, and as you go from there, you can see me then probably a decade later. And I was fortunate enough that both my parents went to university, went to school. They actually both graduated in non-technical fields. And they both, in their career, flipped into a technical field. My mom majored in French and Russian, and she became a CPA. My dad majored in psychology, and he ended up running and starting one of the very early data processing firms in the 60s and 70s when computers started to become affordable and scalable. And he ran a company right here in Princeton uh, that was doing data processing, doing payroll and all kinds of services for local companies that couldn't afford computers themselves. And so this is me in our IBM little data center. And throughout my life, I grew up then in the 70s with this love of computers. So I was pretty sure that I knew what I wanted to do, that I wanted to go into this emerging field of computer science. So through school, I loved math and science, did all those classes, uh, enjoyed that. And my junior year, though, in high school, a teacher of mine said, Kathy, you know, there's in the summer, Stevens Institute runs a program called Women in Engineering. Why don't you go, it just takes a week, and go learn about other things in addition to computer science. And so in that one week, I went up to Stevens, and they showed us that the world of engineers was not only a bunch of men engineering trains or building scrapers, but they helped bring it to life in a really real way. And it was so impactful to me to see a university community, a faculty community, take the time with young girls to show us options. It really opened my eyes that there were many different ways and to apply the things that I love to do. So then I came to Princeton, as you heard, and I was still, though, sure I wanted to be in computer science part of the engineering school, uh, until one moment. It was 2 AM. I was in the basement of the von Neumann Computer Center. If any of you have ever been there, I see heads nodding. The basement, really the basement. S -s Smelly, I have to say. <laughs> Surrounded by a lot of guys, all of us looking at the green screens. And intensity was amazing. I looked around, and the assignment was something like, make these 20 lines of code run 10 milliseconds faster. That was the computer science assignment. And all these folks were all into it and doing all these things. And I looked around. And at that moment, I realized that what I thought I wanted to do, I didn't like at all. I, got, I was not motivated 
by that. And it wasn't just that assignment, but I saw the passion the other folks had, and yet realized that the passion I thought I had for this, that this wasn't really what I loved to do. And that what I really loved to do was seeing things come to life, was bringing them to life. And how could I take that and instead of a computer approach, move into something where I could really tap into that. Now that realization did not come at 201, but it came with a lot of good conversation, with a lot of support from my family, and I actually ended up switching majors very late in my undergraduate uh, journey, and I moved into civil engineering and operations research, which in fact for me, I had always thought of was the guys who built the bridges, or linked with the architecture school. But in fact, in that moment, the field of computer graphics were emerging and how engineering was happening so I could leverage my love of computers. But in that operations research, I began to learn that's the brain, the math and the science behind how we bring everything to life in the world of manufacturing. So this was my graduation day. The woman on the left is my grandmother, the woman who was on that buggy. That's my dad, my mom was actually taking the picture but I ended up graduating then with a degree in civil engineering and operations research. At that time, I had spent my whole life living in about a 15 to 20 mile radius of right here. I grew up in central New Jersey. I happened to have been born in Princeton Hospital. And I ended up going to school here. Didn't necessarily plan to do it that way, but ended up going to school here. I then got a job right out of school as an engineer at Johnson & Johnson in our pharmaceutical business. Once again, in this same 20-mile circle. But over the next five years, seven years of my career, the thing that I learned was the willingness to not only learn from the tremendous leaders there, but to go and do projects in areas that I didn't really understand, to build my network, to learn what it meant to work in a manufacturing plant, to, at the same time to design a building, to understand to what it meant to be an engineer, not doing the calculation, but doing the project, figuring out the value it was gonna to bring to the company from a business view. And so from that, I had the opportunity to move to Puerto Rico, to go work in a fast-growing manufacturing plant. Big decision for me, my, all my family, all my friends, my whole life was here, but I ended up doing it. It was supposed to be for one to two years. I ended up living there for seven. You can see up here a picture of me and my boss at the time building a huge medicines plant that saved now countless lives around the world and getting to learn the experience to build that and how you bring new medicines into the world. From there, I had the chance to move to Europe. And so I moved there uh, in 2000 to run a pharmaceutical manufacturing plant, a plant that also made shampoos and cosmetics and some medical devices. And that also was a decision that changed my life forever. Not only because I moved to Italy, which is a gorgeous place to live, by the way, I have to say, but because one day, going to the beach in front of where I lived, I met a man who is now my husband. His name is Giancarlo. He did not speak a word of English at the time, <laughs> not one word. If you meet him today, you'd say he speaks a hundred words, right? <laughs> Sandy's met him. He actually serenaded her at our Christmas party this That's year. Right. So he has a good voice. Uh, and so his life has nothing to do with healthcare. He was a professional soccer player for his whole life. And so when you think about math and the angles of how his life works or math and how my life works, the thing that was amazing is that through those experiences at J&J, through taking that chance to go somewhere different, it completely changed the course of my life. From there, I worked in Belgium, and I had assignments around the world, and then ended up coming back here to the US after having lived in Europe for about eight years. But when you go across the kind of, of uh, breadth of what we do at Johnson & Johnson, as Cindy said, there are so many ways, and I think this is our core message, there are so many ways to apply the principles you learn of problem solving. It's not just the equation, but it's how you go about looking at challenges and problems and how you can bring them to life in so many different places and careers. So this shows 
uh, the manufacturing line of one of our brands in J&J. &J. So how many of you wear contact lenses? Okay. How many of you wear AccuView contact lenses? Good, it looks like almost all of you. Good choice, <laughs> good choice. So at J&J, &J, we are the proud owners of that and inventors of the soft contact lens. It began by uh, a company almost 25, 30, no, more than now, 30, 30 years, years ago. ago. Yep. And the technology to go from those old hard lenses to soft lenses, we pioneered. So I want you to think for a minute about what it takes in the world of eye correction, what it takes to develop a contact lens. So you start with needing to understand the science of the eye and how that works and the equations that go into how the eye, both of its shape and the rods and the spheres and the ability of the eye to capture an image. You all know the story, right, of the pupil and the reason why our pupils are black is the same reason why black holes are black, because light goes in and they ca it can't come out because of the incredible functioning of the eye. So then you say, okay, how do you correct for an eye that's not functioning perfectly? Well, the first solution were glasses. And I happen to have a very complex eye, so my <laughs> contact lenses are in our R&D pipeline and I'm waiting for them to come out. <laughs> but the correction then goes into the lens equation and the calculation, the difference between the curvature in the back and the front of the glasses that does that. So then imagine you want to apply that and have people not need these things flying off their faces and you want to put that on your eye. Well, then it becomes a problem of suction, it becomes a problem of comfort to not only have in that very fine space the ability to change that equation of the light before it hits your eye, but to stay on your eye, to be comfortable and to fit on that and to create that right balance with the fluids in your eye and the, the actual composition of the lens. So then you go from that science and technology, now you have to make these things. So the engineers have to take those equations and think about the hundreds of thousands of different combinations. We have 160,000 different combinations right now of lenses that we sell in Johnson & Johnson. And every year we make and our engineers build lines that make repeatedly and beautifully, these are the little cavities where we form the lenses, those lenses. So 11 million a day, my team is making right now in Jacksonville, Florida and Cork, Ireland for the whole world. In the time we're in this room, that's about a half a million lenses that come from that technology. So it's a beautiful thing when you think about the ability of all these different folks with different functional backgrounds to work together to bring an innovation like that to life that truly does change our lives and our ability to see better and see more clearly. So when you think of those functions and working together, at the core I always believe though is that you have to build your career around the things that you love to do. For me, I made a choice to switch, <coughs> excuse me, majors, which was the best thing I've done ever. It really made a difference. And so when you look at what makes us all strong in our function, it's also important that we share and we build a community around that as well. So I want to tell you one small story as I close up. So this hashtag, I look like an engineer, was started last year in August. There was a young engineer, beautiful young girl, female engineer, works in an IT company, and she was asked to be part of a marketing campaign to recruit more people into their company. So she was an IT stack engineer, so stacks of servers and things. Now you can think about that concept and that title. And beautiful picture of her as part of this campaign with other engineers. And the title is, you know, is she's one of the engineers and she's an example that all engineers come from all sizes and shapes and backgrounds. Well, unfortunately, she started to get incredibly negative, horrible comments. How can that be an engineer? Oh, she's probably picked because she's pretty some amazingly horrible things when you see Twitter and comments that came in. So she wrote a blog about what that felt like and why she was as much of an engineer as anybody else was an engineer. 
And someone tweeted that and started this hashtag. And in the matter of days and weeks, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of engineers around the world, myself included, my team included, this was just a group of people we had at that moment we heard about that, uh, came together and started to tweet, yeah, I look like an engineer too, that we're all different. And it doesn't matter what our background is or what we look like. It matters that we do what we love to do. And so if you have a chance, go take a look at this. It's a really great story, and you can maybe start the hashtag of I look like a mathematician or <laughs> I look like something else. But so with that, um, you know, we were really happy to share our careers, and now we wanted to open it up to all of you for any questions, comments, et cetera. Thank you.